the safety honor and welfare of your country comes first your own ease and comfort will come last You are charged with Indian Army Act Section 41, waging war against the king. Fire! रात दिन अपने सीने पे जुवाजती आजादी दे राग नो बंद कर ला। सब तो पहला मैं हिंदुस्तानी हाँ। After Gyasuddin Tughlaq, his 45-year-old cousin Firosha Tughlaq took over the reins of Delhi Sultanate, which by then has already reduced in its power and its size. As Firosha Tughlaq decided not to recapture the city already lost, he built a new city and therefore came the fifth city of Delhi, Firozabad. Three years into his rule, Firosha Tughlaq decided to build a new city on the banks of River Yamuna. In most ways, Firosha Tughlaq's era was the continuation of his predecessors, especially when one gets to weigh the work accomplished throughout the Tughlaq era. He never expected to come to the throne. He was a cousin of Muhammad bin Tughlaq. And after the death of Muhammad bin Tughlaq, when there was nobody else to come, he was the one who came onto the throne. And uh, he had a long reign in which the Delhi Sultanate actually prospered. And one of the things that he did as soon as he came on the throne was reverse a lot of the unjust and excessively high taxation that Muhammad bin Tughlaq had uh, levied onto people to probably make up for all his failed schemes, such whether the currency or the shifting of the capital. He got letters of forgiveness from the people against whom Muhammad bin Tughlaq had acted very unjustly. Some whom he'd maimed, some whom he'd killed, then he got it from their relatives, whatever. So he got all these and put them inside the grave of Muhammad bin Tughlaq, hoping that his predecessor, whom he considered also his patron, would uh, somehow be forgiven by God. His kingdom is also remembered for a department of charity called Diwan-e Kherat. Several hospitals, sarais and roads were constructed within his city. Great gardens were laid. As per the account of Shams-e Siraj Afif, the number ran as high as 1200 gardens. Only few have survived today. The new city founded in the year 1354 on the banks of Yamuna housed three palaces. Though smaller in size than the mighty Tughlaqabad, massive ramparts were built to withstand any attack. Because the need for water drove him here. The, when they were in uh, Lal Court, they had of course tanks and whatever, but they didn't have natural, uh, a, a flowing river. Neither did Jahanpana nor did Siri. So this was the place where they had came to for water. 
this was called Kushke Firozabad, means the palace of Firozabad. Later on, the British started calling it Firosha Kotla, but it was actually Kushke Firozabad. Now, within Kushke Firozabad, there were three main palaces, and of course, the mahals for the zanana. This is a prototype actually which was copied by the Mughals when they built their forts. The first place that we entered to was, is, was a huge quadrangle called uh, the Mehele uh, Angur or Mehele Sehene Gili. And that is where he met with his special nobles, the ulema, the, the nobles, even very famous literary people, they met him there. After that, as you come in, where we are standing just now, this was the Mehele Chajjai Choba. This is where he met with his private attendants. And then as we go in further is where he had the bare arm, which was uh, as you have Diwane arm in uh, Lal Qala and other uh, Mughal forts, where he met with the general public. The near century long Tughlaq dynasty rule is often described as pivotal in not just shaping the history of medieval India, but also the eras to come. What we saw in this 100 years of Tughlaq rule was the building of four new cities of Tughlaqabad, Shahapana, Dalatabad and Ferozabad. New ideas emerged in arts, literature, architecture. New initiatives were taken by the emperors, no matter how much questionable they were, but they were new nonetheless. This is a time period also for, let's say, Sufi efflorescence which is kind of paradoxical because Nizamuddin Aulia dies very early in the Tughlaq era, but he's put in place certain, certain ideas, he's put in place certain kinds of organization which bear fruition in the 14th century, in the period of the Tughlaq. So that's one of the reasons why the Tughlaqs are in constant contention with the Sufis, because of what had preceded it. So one sign of, let's say, Chishti attempts at dominance comes out from the literary production. So the great Marfuzat are written in the Tughlaq era. The Khairul Majalis is written here. This is the time period when Gishu Daraz is learning in Delhi and he'll go off to the Deccan to an area conquered by Muhammad Tughlaq and set up a huge Deccani Silsila. This is the time period where before that, Burhanuddin Karib has also moved to the Deccan. So this great diaspora of Sufis starts taking place in the Tughlaq era. Standing proof of his abiding interest in monuments are Dargah Roshan Chirag Dili, built in the name of Sufi saint Nasiruddin Muhammad Chirag, the last of Sufis of Shishti order and Kadmi Sharif. As the name suggests, the site of Kadmi Sharif situated two kilometers to the south of city, is believed to have been blessed with the sacred footprint of the Prophet. Feroz Shah's son, Fateh Khan, also lies buried here. Among other major monuments built in Feroz Shah's times were Khirki and Begumpur Masjid both located within the once boundaries of his predecessor, Muhammad bin Tughlaq city, Jahapana. Begumpur Masjid stands on a land which is said to have been the Jagir of Begum Sultani in the time of Alauddin Khilji. The opinions also differ on whether the mosque was constructed in the year 1387 by Feroz Shah's wazir, Khane Jaha Jona Shah, a Hindu convert of Deccani origin, or by Muhammad bin Tughlaq himself. Mind you, some of the great administrators in the Tughlaq era were people of South Asian origin. Okay? So, think of Ainul Mulk Meru. He's a military commander who tries to become wazir, fails to become wazir, protests to Muhammad, to Feroz Shah Tughlaq and says, you know, I, you know I, I, I have respect for you, I don't have respect for your wazir, I will remain loyal to you, I won't be loyal to uh, the wazir. And he's sent off as a military commander of the Punjab and the Sindh region with unfettered access. Now the interesting thing is, who's in the Mulk Meru? He's of South Asian origin. He converts to Islam and he becomes one of the integral 
participants in this great Tughlaq epoch. The Wazirs of the Tughlaqs are, are from South India. The Brahmins from South India and they dominate Delhi. They are the guys who make all these mosques. How is that possible? So, I mean, we miss all of that when we focus on these Sultans and think of the Sultans themselves as people who are, you know, quirky. Either absolutist and failures or, you know, whatever. Another piece of art, Khirki Masjid, built in the year 1375 by Wazir Khane Jaha, stands today surrounded by ever-growing urban spaces of Khirki village, a busy settlement near Saket in today's New Delhi. With its unconventional style and a fort-like architecture, an entrance inside the mosque having several windows leads to a long corridor with two square courtyards on each side. The traces of ancient Indian architecture could be traced in the columns and walls of its superstructure. Uh, Firoz Shah, uh, I like to call him the first conservator of India. He not only built many, in fact he built 1200 gardens all over India. He is the, also the builder of five smart cities because Hasi, Firozabad, all these were built by him. Not just this Firozabad, but another Firozabad also. And he built five cities. And uh, under him, uh, his Prime Minister, Khane Jahan Tilangani, who had come with him from the south after one of the conquests, he was a uh, convert. And uh, as the name Telangani suggests, he was from Telangana. And uh, he came and he built seven large mosques here, out of which one of them is here, Jama Masjid. These seven mosques that he built, they more or less had the same kind of structure. They were very, very solid, made of local stone. But surprisingly, there was no calligraphy on it. Because if you see any mosque of any other era, except the Tughlaq period, you will find calligraphy on it. Housed in Feroz Shah Kotla Fort, this grand Jami Masjid was also built during his reign. The masjid is said to have inspired even tyrants like the Moor Lung, who replicated it in the mosque built at Samarkand. Standing over five centuries, this mosque has witnessed history at its very steps. parked themselves, cam they camped right outside this uh, fort and uh, he, the, after he had uh, conquered Delhi, defeated Iqbal Khan who was Malu Khan who was at that time the de facto ruler, the, he, he came and read the khutbah of victory in this mosque itself and uh, he was so impressed by this mosque that uh, he took the masons who had built this mosque with him to Samarkand. The city also had two tall symbols connecting it with the glorious past of the great Emperor Ashok and his reign. Two Ashokan pillars were transported from Topra and Merat. While one of the pillars still stands here, drawing visitors and devotees at the shrine under this pyramid structure, the other Ashokan pillar was planted at the hunting lodge of Firosha Tughlaq on the ridge near Bara Hindu Rao. It was partially destroyed in the reign of Farooq Seer, one of the rulers of the weakening Mughal Empire. Together, these two pillars add an ancient touch to the range of medieval monuments of that era in Feroz Shah's Delhi. The 14th century was, a, was 
the century of many people, not just of Muhammad Tughlaq and the Tughlaqs. So let's say, if you were to take a look at the literary production that happened in the 14th century, that gives you a sense of the intellectual turmoil, the intellectual creativity that existed here. So the, the 14th century is markedly different from the 13th for, let's say, the great production of history that happened. This is the time period of the great Tawarikh. I've talked about Barani, we have, let's think about Isami as well. So, you know, some of the great historians are writing this time. And these great historians are building up on the work done previously by authors such as Amir Khosrow. So there's a new style of writing history. So the great legal digests are produced in, this, in the period of the Tughlaqs, the Fiki Firoz Shahi, the Fatwai Tatar Khani. These are texts which the Mughals will pick up and start writing. And some of these are, let's say, built, done through the patronage of the great Tughlaq monarchs. It's done also by the patronage that is given to literatures and jurists of a certain kind of a background. So the Tughlaqs are responsible for a lot of these things. Another story adding to the dimension of the structure is the story of jinns, which were believed to have populated the abandoned city several decades later. Today, every Thursday, several devotees come here and write to the jinns, believing the wish will be met. In 1976, at the height of the emergency, when uh, Sanjay Gandhi gave orders for the, all the illegal settlements of Turkman uh, gate to be bulldozed. At that time, uh, there were thousands were, I think, rendered homeless at that point of time and very poor people. And uh, one of them was a man called Lado Shah. And it is said that Lado Shah was a kind of a saint or unke kabze mein jin the. When he came here, all the devotees who would go to Lado Shah and Turkman gate started coming here. And uh, now today the, the thing is that there is not a single room in this entire complex, which used to be the madarsa or the palace, where you don't find on a Thursday incense burning, lights being burned, flowers being offered, and thousands of people who just come and you know like they come and stick uh, their letters on it. Arziyan jisko kehte hain ki wo unki jo arzi hai, whatever they want uh, fulfilled, they'll come and stick it there, and then when they wishes are fulfilled, then they bring uh, dehs of huge big cauldrons of uh, zarda and biryani and they distribute it. Known as a builder, the pacifist Firosha Tughlaq added to the already existing monuments built by the earlier rulers. A madarsa and a college were constructed at Horse Khas, the water reservoir built by Alauddin Khilji. Take a look at the Qutub today and we say, wow, oh, what a wonderful minar and we all say 13th century, we forget the fact that when you take a look at the Qutub, you're taking a look also at a 14th century monument. The upper stories are all white marble made by Firoz Shah Tughlaq. What genius inspired that? What was he attempting to accomplish? You take a look at the photo, at the, uh, at the photo of the Firoz Shah, you don't understand what he was attempting to inscribe on the land. These are huge people, it's a huge century. It's a century which creates the world that we know today, as all centuries do. But you just keep focusing upon its heroes and its villains, and you won't have a century. You just have, you know, marvelous escapades. That's all you have. That's not history. Today, he lies buried at horse cars with his tomb overlooking the water masonry and a seminary. After Feroz Shah's death, Tughlaq dynasty went under a rapid decline, with his successors and nobles pitching a battle of succession. The city witnessed slaughter from within. Muhammad Qasim Farishta writes about rebellion by Feroz Shah's nephew Baha that led to massacre in the streets. 
but Delhi was yet to witness its worst of massacres. After nearly eight decades, Tughlaq dynasty in Delhi was walking towards the evening of his rule. In what could be termed as a final blow to its legitimacy and authority in Delhi, the city was sacked by Turko-Mongol raider Timur Lang. More than 50,000 people in Delhi were massacred and looted. Such was the state of affairs that then Delhi Sultan, Nasir al-Din Tughlaq, was without men and money. The city was reduced to an utter chaos. It didn't have a ruler for next four months. More than Firoza Tughlaq's failures, we should be look Firoza Tughlaq or his vizier's failures. We should be looking at the failures of the successors of Firoza Tughlaq. In that sense, I mean, you can think of Aurangzeb. Aurangzeb had this great mighty empire which was not ready to collapse on his death. But it's what happened the years after his death. The inability of the falling monarchs to keep this territory knit together. Or the to inability of, his, of Aurangzeb's successors to deal with the challenges that existed in the 18th century. That's the problem. You know, so rather than looking at individuals and saying they failed, it's the succeeding years that failed. The nomadic conqueror of Burla Mongol tribe, Timur had long set his eyes over Delhi's Sultanate, which by then was already under decline. After stamping his name, raiding Egypt, Syria and other Turkey confines, Timur wrote easterly. What we have to recognize about Timur is that he actually breaks, he ends this fragile frontier that had kept the Mongols on one side and the Sultanate on the other side. Now the Sultanate was conjoined with, let's say, Samarkand. It's at this time that you see a large migration of Afghans into the Sultanate, immediately after Timur. So this, this kind of infusion of people, the demographic changes that happened in, in the Sultanate in the in following Timur's invasion in the 15th century, and the 16th century, all of that is something that we should actually turn around and say, ah, oh, this is now a consequence of Timur's invasion. The Tughlaqs made a brief comeback after Timur's sacking in 1398. The dynasty fell apart and were replaced by Timur's pick, Khizr Khan, in the year 1413. Khizr Khan established Sayyid dynasty, the fourth dynasty, to rule Delhi Sultanate from the year 1414 to 1450. He served as the governor of Firosha Tughlaq in Multan and after sacking by Timur, he chose to remain his vassal. It's also recorded that when Timur invaded India, Khan had joined him. After his death, his son Mubarak Shah succeeded him to the throne. In his coins, he called his name Moizuddin Mubarak Shah. The city of Mubarakabad was found by him in the year 1433, now known as Kotla Mubarakpur. The decline of Sayyid dynasty began soon after the baton was passed on from Mubarak Shah to Muhammad Shah Sayyid and then finally to Alam Shah Sayyid. Alam Shah was described as one of the weakest of Sayyid rulers. The story goes that he himself gave up the throne in favour of Behlol Khan Lodi. Behlol Khan Lodi established Lodi dynasty in Delhi which went on to rule Delhi for next 75 years. As per one version, Behlol Lodi, whose ancestors served under Sayyid dynasty, occupied Delhi in the year 1451. While last of Sayyids, Alam Shah resigned his crown without opposition, continued to live at Badayu and rule over a tiny principality till his death in 1478. The era of Lodi is said to have been relatively less political turbulent. Behlol Lodi's successor, Sikandar Lodi, is remembered for his love for poetry, architecture and music. 
an author who penned his poems under pseudonym Gulrakh. Lodi is said to have convinced Sufi poet and scholar Jalal Khan and Maulana Jamali to come to India. Regarded as one of the great Sufi saints of pre-Mughal era, Jamali remained attached to the royal court of Sikandar Lodi and then to Ibn Babur and Humayu. He lies buried in Mehroli. Next to his grave is of another unknown person, referred to as Kamali. He was very close to Sikandar Lodi, but there was a rift between him and Ibrahim Lodi. And that is why he praised for the success of Babur when he arrived in Hindustan and he wrote a panegyric for Babar in, in the praise of Babar and he wished for his success and he was also close associated with Humayu. About Kamali we do not have an exact reference who he was. Some says that he was uh, Jamali's brother. Some says that he was you know it was just for the rhythmic or rhyming purpose to give a fame to his resting place that Jamali Kamali uh, came into being but we do not have any historical evidence to this very uh, other name Kamali. Ibrahim Lodi succeeded Sikandar Lodi. After a relative era of peace the monarch's court caught up with the intrigues of power as he decided to check his powerful nobles. But the revolt was brewing as nobles led by governor of Lahore, Daulat Khan Lodi conspired against Ibrahim Lodi. Sending for the ruler in Kabul named Jalaluddin Muhammad Babur to invade and throw out Sikandar Lodi. The battle of Panipat was thus fought. Baba defeated Ibrahim Lodi, laying the foundation of Mughal Empire in India, or to say, in the Asian subcontinent. Well, that was also the full stop of Delhi's Sultanate. However, it left behind its legacy in the form of arts, literature, architecture, and an everlasting order of humanity called Sufism. In our next episode of Talking History, we'll trace back the rise of Sufi order in Delhi.